Hey there, everybody. We've got a special treat for you. You guys know that I'm a huge fan of Richie bikes and we are here with our friend, Fergus from Richie. Hello. <laughs> How's it going? Good, how are you? Thanks for coming. So we are in uh, at Richie headquarters, which has a lot of history. So Fergus is gonna give us a tour of some cool frames and we'll also talk about some newer bikes. Yeah, absolutely, love to. Should we kick it off with this guy? Yeah, let's do, let's do this okay. one. Okay, so this is one of the original off-road bikes that Tom made. Uh, when the mountain bike was first coming around, he had a friend, uh, John Finley Scott, who said, let's make a 650 bike. So this is one of 10 off-road 650. So by today's standards, it'd be considered a gravel bike. Pretty normal clearance in the back, um, as far as like 130 spacing. Tires would have been close to 48. Uh, some other neat features like the park bench, which is Tom's kind of signature for that time. And just beautiful fillet brazing. So looking forward to building this up eventually. So we were talking earlier, um, 650B was pretty prevalent, but for some, re some reason, 26 inch took off. It's more about availability of parts. Yeah. 650 was, was big in Europe for like the off-road cow trail riding crowd. For whatever reason, this just didn't take off at that time like 26 did. So yeah. that's why it is what it is. <laughs> and this was gonna be designed around the flat bar or, or a drop? Yeah, great question. Uh, both. So okay. people would build it up with either drop bars or flat bars, which again, kind of a unique thing at that time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, pretty cool bike, really versatile. So, All right. So, uh, well, yeah, come on in. Tom Ritchie Coffee. <laughs> yeah, so we share the space with uh, High Note Coffee. The way that we met him was he was he was actually roasted a lot of Tom's coffee they brought in from Rwanda after he did the Project Rwanda stuff. Oh, cool. So it's kind of nice to have that connection. Yeah. Plus, never any supply of coffee. Nice. <laughs> and this is the space. This is where a lot of everything happens. This office is the North American office, so we do warranty, customer service, marketing, some sales. I build up all the bikes here. If you watch our YouTube channel, um, I film Subscribe. everything here. <laughs> please do. What, what should we start with uh, let's, let's start with some of the, these bikes on the, the wall. Yeah. So what's this thing? Yeah, so this is the Mount Cross. This is, for lack of a better term, a monster cross bike. It came at the request of Thomas Frischnecht, who was racing both cyclocross and mountain for Richie. And the idea was just a bigger tire clearance bike. So at that time, it would have been maybe a 38 to 40 C tire. Mountain bike rear spacing, so 135, but you can run a road crank set. Again, it's it's kind of a bike that we want today. Uh, would these would have been the, the handlebars that, that someone would run on the on this bike? This was the handlebar width at the time. That was, that's narrow, that's, those are like fixie bars. <laughs> Almost literally, the, when I was a kid mountain biking, these were the bars. Recently I was buying a bike for, or buying bars for my track bike and they call them street bars and they're literally the same. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, next would be this guy, which is a really cool timepiece. So this is the first full suspension, for lack of a better term. At this period in time, Richie's were being welded in Japan at Toyo. So the front triangle would have been welded there and then all, they would be sent back to the US and Tom would do all the finish. So he would do the stays, the brazons, the alignment. This bike is very unique in that it has this kind of elastomer shock absorber and it would rely on the springiness of the steel and the chain stay to give you that soft tail feeling. So this is, this is free to slide up and down. There'd be a, some kind of rubber elastomer there. Yeah, it'd sit in here. Oh, in there, okay. We didn't make this for very long. It, it, maybe it was a, uh, maybe a year or two before we stopped making these, but this would have been a first, one of the first full suspension bikes. What did the front end look like? What, what kind of fork was it running? Uh, it probably would have run a rock shocks and travel on those at that time was like 80. Oh dang. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Short travel. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny because everything kind of comes full circle. And so now, you know, you've seen Pinarello with their gravel bike and they do this kind of thing. Right. There's the- uh the <laughs> Yeah, the Explore group set that has yep. the, short travel fork. I'll let you put on the stand because I don't want to accidentally yeah. crush things. <laughs> I'm a very mediocre mechanic. I will let the pros handle the bike. <laughs> Far from pro. Yeah, so transitioning, this is the P21. This has been, all of our P series bikes were like our race mountain bikes. So the idea was this was a 21 pound bike. And I think we even got down to a P19. I think. I'm pretty sure this was Heinrich Jernis's 
world championship bike that he won worlds on. You know, when I was a kid, this was the bike, you know, right. <laughs> like full rigid. It uses this kind of soft righty stem. No, These are making a comeback too. <laughs> exactly, all of this stuff does. So like that soft tail would have either had this or a one inch rock shocks fork. Mm -hmm. And again, it's just kind of wild to think about this was race winning componentry at that time. You right. know, like you were saying, the narrow bars, these tires I think are like a 1.8. So really not that big. Yeah. The main triangle and the fork would have been made by Toyo mm -hmm. and then the back end would have been finished by Tom. Yeah, it's amazing like the like looking at the componentry, like this stuff people would pass over at a bike co-op you right. know, today, but back then it was like top of the line. Top of the line. <laughs> You know, and a funny reference is, you know, when I sent you that Ascent, I wanted to use this kind of stuff because A, I grew up with it, but I knew that it functioned really well. And so right. um, it's cool to be able to reintroduce that. Yeah. So maybe gravel bikes are just 90s mountain bikes <laughs> after <laughs> all. The internet was right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. His tires are too supple on that too bike. Too supple. <laughs> Tom isn't very precious about bikes yeah. like at all except for this. <laughs> this is his baby. So yeah. what's the story behind this bike? This isn't, doesn't look like a gravel bike. <laughs> Not a gravel bike, but it was a gravel bike. Or when he first decided that he wanted to get into building frames, he mainly experimented with taking apart other bikes, finding broken ones, repairing them, and then learning from how they failed. Uh, and then he's built his own bikes. This was maybe number three. The first one he would have built would have been for himself, but this was, bike that Tom made for his dad. Oh, dang. Yeah, so his dad was quite the writer. It is full of just fun little tricks and really kind of amazing. I, every time I see it, I'm just like, this is nuts. Like, none of the parts match, <laughs> but they're all the lightest, best performing parts of that time. Interesting things that are holdovers are like the semi-integrated seat mast, mm -hmm. the threadless stem. Uh, it's insanely light. I think it's like, 16 pounds oh, or really? something. Dang. Yeah. This yeah, this there. brake line right here, like this really sleek little right. guide, and then just goes in through here, comes back to this Mayfac racer. This little seat stay bridge that's not really a bridge. <laughs> this thing is, it's paper thin almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. The fact that the fork crown oh. doesn't have. Yeah, no caps. It's yeah, hollow. left it open. This is also a biplane crown okay. that he would have fabricated himself. Pretty cool stuff for a 17 year old kid to do. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what you were doing when you were 17. I wasn't doing anything like this. Right. He um, must have really liked his dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So really, really awesome bike. But you know, when you talk about gravel bikes, this is what those dudes were riding when it come, for all of those epic gravel roads. Mm -hmm. Tom would do these rides with this fellow, Yopes Brandt, who's his mentor. Yeah. And there's these photos of dudes on their 23 mil tubs doing <laughs> legit gravel sections today. Right. Things that I'll be on my gravel bike and like, how are they riding this? Because if you look at the gearing, you have That's a 44. <laughs> yeah. The 44 is the smallest chain ring. And then this is, I think, a 23. Oh, wow. You know? So, and to him, bikes were just bikes. Like you just ride them, you right. know? And you didn't need a specific purpose bike you just went out all right so we've got a, a more modern Richie in the stand here this is the the Richie Outback we've got to review this on the channel what was the thinking in changing the geometry between the the first kind of iteration of the Outback to to this one when it was out on the drawing board the idea was that it would be a monster cross bike so much like the Mount Cross we wanted something that was more than just a cross bike. Cause when people think of cross, they think of racing and just drooling on yourself, that kind of yeah. thing. <laughs> so we wanted to make a bike that was more. Mm -hmm. The first Outback was very much, very crossy. Mm -hmm. And the feedback that we got from people was taller head tube, slacken up the angle. They want to do more on the bike. So that's where the Outback V2 comes out. It has all the mounts. So if you want to go on a multiple day trip or even just put fenders on, it's capable of that, but still very sporty. So you yeah. can leave it blank as it were, and then go and rip around on a gravel course, even cyclocross if you wanted to. One of the things that people uh, either love or hate is non-tapered head tube. Why, why go non-tapered? Great question. That's <laughs> very much the ethos of the company. When you start increasing the head tube, you have to do all these other things to the down tube 
to make it stronger, to make it come together, and then it's mm. not light. A lot of times when people increase the down tube to support a tapered head tube, the tubing has to get real thin because they want to maintain this weight, this ideal weight, and it's just not what the material is, is best at. For steel, the smaller the diameter, the stronger it is, but it's also lighter. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we had a very good riding bike, a bike that felt good when you're on it, and was light as well. And so that's where the one or inch and an eighth comes in. Yeah. You also get a lot of uh, dampening going on with the tapered head tube, everything's so stiff in the front end. Right. And a lot of that's informed by what people think they need for performance. You know, mm -hmm. like a Porsche is a lot of fun to drive if you're doing 80 on a twisty road. Yeah. If you're going to get groceries in it, it sucks. Knowing that, we want to make sure that, again, the bike just felt good when you rode it. Sweet, well, let's get uh, the ascent on the stand. Okay. So the whole reason for this trip is, uh, you know, we've had a chance to, to ride and I'm gonna review the ascent, but I'm dropping it off at uh, Richie HQ. Outback versus ascent, I mean, is it like a completely different rider? I yeah, mean, you know, it's, it's basically, the person that wants to do more off-road on a bike. The first ascent was basically our Swiss Army knife. So we wanted it to be able to take 26 through 700C, uh, be able to travel, mm -hmm. and it did all of that. And we knew that we wanted to reintroduce that frame into the lineup. So we came out with the V2, and the V2, again, just spoke to everything that the people wanted. They wanted more tire clearance, they wanted a little bit more slack head tube, and they wanted mounts all over the bike. So you call them frame barnacles, which <laughs> I love. It, it has all of that. Yeah. So that if you want to go and get lost in the wilderness, yes, absolutely. The updates we made to it were boost spacing because it was primarily a mountain right. group set that would be going on here and through axles. You kind of have to have, <laughs> otherwise your bike isn't going to sell. Right. Um, One notable feature for me is um, the, the longish uh, rear end relative to other kind of bikes that are coming out there. Yeah. Um, was that just to accommodate wider tires or was it kind of a handling decision as well? All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the whole, the whole super tucked tire drives me nuts. A few things happen when you try to smush the tires far forward as you can. You're basically putting your weight right over this rear wheel where you're mm -hmm. just smashing into things and it, it's not fun to ride. Mm -hmm. So you lengthen the stays, it becomes more stable, becomes more comfortable. But then there's other factors too, like chain ring clearance. So if you wanted to run a bigger chain ring and you have a short stay, the geometry of it is such that you're limiting your chain ring options. Right. On top of that, obviously tire clearance, but again, it comes back down to the crank. Are you gonna have clearance for your tire chain ring and not smush the hell out of your chain stay. Right. A, a lot of things come into informing how we design a bike that's gonna perform really well while still accommodating things that people are looking for. When you guys were designing the front end, did you have uh, mountain bike alt bars in mind or, or drop bars? No, there, there wasn't one bar or another. Yeah. Uh, we knew that based on the shape of bars that people are really gravitating towards, that this bike could really take both. In having the Coyote available for it, if you're used to having a drop bar bike, the Coyote gives you that nice sweep mm -hmm. while also not having to change your reach too much, if at all. And so you can maintain that distance. It should feel just as good with a drop bar or a flat bar. Um, in your current lineup, is this the bike that confuses the most people? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> let me think, yeah. So I feel like people, people will look at the Outback and they can see the, the cross inspiredness, mm -hmm. but they'll look at the Ascent and uh, they, you know, they may look at the rear and go, well, that's not exactly you know, a cross racy you know, gravel bike. What is it? But it's not as slack as like a modern mountain bike. You know, it's in this interesting zone. In my opinion, people want their bike to tell them what to do. Right. And they want to go in and say, that's a cyclocross bike that I can do cyclocross on, or that's a road bike that I can do whatever on, right? Rather, I'd rather say, well, just here's a bike, do whatever you want on it, you know? like. <laughs> Don't feel like it has to tell you what to do. And it is, it, it's a little frustrating because people just say, oh, it's a mountain bike, it's a mountain bike. No, <laughs> it's not, but mm. sure. I do, I do hear you where, you know, sometimes like a bike, if you look at the, the geometry numbers will kind of inform you a little bit of, as to what it's doing. Yeah. And this one is, um, I don't know, it's just capable, you know, but isn't geared towards, I think, a, a particular discipline. 
uh, as much as some other bike. Capable is probably the exact word. You know, if I saw someone commuting on this and like front rack grocery getter, sick. Yeah. You know, <laughs> if I'm out riding Mount Tam and I see some dude shredding down the hill on it, awesome. You know, like all of those things in between, it's, it's definitely our most versatile bike, but also probably most confusing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like a kind of a, a tabula rasa bike. Like if you were to design a comfortable, capable bike without a particular discipline in mind, it, you, you might land on something like this, or you, you'd land on something like this. Cool, uh, what else can we do? I think that's a, that was a lot of content, right? Yes. Good content. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, Fergus, for the, yeah, the tour and, and nerding out uh, bikes with us. Uh, if you guys want to learn more about Richie, you guys have a website, you have a gram, and a YouTube channel. YouTube channel. Uh, all of our socials are at Richie Logic. So YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. <laughs> um, are you guys really on TikTok? I'm really on TikTok. <laughs> I have a funny story for that, but we're on TikTok. I don't, I don't dance in any of them. I try to just inform as much as I can with it. Follow Richie and see what they're up to. If you guys like this content, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Consider supporting the channel by buying merch from the merch store. That's how we keep the channel going or join us on Patreon. And as always, keep the supple side down.